Hi. I'm just rubbing down here. And, uh, um, I think it's just start with saying I think David's work's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. what can one say? That whole series of images just had such a effect in terms of the anti-war movement. More than any other series of images, I think, that I know of. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's fantastic. Did the, the, the one on at the, the last shot, did the press print that? Was that they did? Because I knew that I've never seen that before. It's I, d I, d I didn't take the right camera with me, and these the, I've got two pictures of it an upright and a horizontal taken by Jess Hurt, who's, who's taken a lot of pictures, Falstock, yeah. and writing his novels, and they're really lovely, lovely pictures. Yeah, another fantastic. It's an incredible street intervention shot. I mean, it's such a subversion of the Big Ben of exactly. Westminster. <laughs> it was meant to be. Yeah, no, I mean, it really mm -hmm. works. Oh, yeah, the graphics, yeah. the imagery is so great, it gave a real professional sense to stop the war campaign because of the graphics that they produced. Yeah. Gave it such a great Identity. standing yeah. professionalism. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so, our stuff well, is well let, moving on from that, I'm not a professional artist. Um, I did some training in photography and um, my main aim sort of when I left uh, college was to become a photojournalist but I quickly realised that I had too much imagination. I w couldn't hold to the facts enough. So um, luck in 2002 I was working for a photojournalist called Network Photographers and I was introduced by one of them, Jenny Matthews, an amazing photographer who focuses on women at war. Um, she introduced uh, Peter to me because he needed some help with some technical assistance with a piece of work. Um, and from there sprang a collaboration that's continued since the end of 2002 till now. So it probably won't seem, seem so professional the work, I would imagine, although you're a professional artist. Oh. How do we move forward on that? Oh, yeah. um. Yeah, so we're just going to show the work we've done together in different mediums and in different different contexts. I mean, one of the points, you know, like as David has shown brilliantly, is if you're making political work, you need to get it out. It's no good just sitting, doing it, and it sits in the studio like a, you know, it's like if you're a normal sort of painter, that can work for you. You just need to do it. So, but with the sort of work that we want to do, we actually want it to be part of the campaigns going on and all, all the work we did for since the invasion of Iraq was on that subject for many years you know some some diverted into other areas but the main focus on it was what was going on and the increasing destruction of Iraq um, and we, we did a we were invited to an exhibition in Norwich called East and we um, we made a room we were given a room at the bottom of the uh, college of the art school, and so we produced. We had a room where it was like in between being a studio, uh, a workshop, and um, a gallery. It was a sort of hybrid sort of space where we we managed to get a computer, um, a not computer printer sponsored, which Hewlett Packard. Because um, I teach at the Royal College, and Hewlett Packard thought it might be good for publicity if they lent us a printer. Until they actually saw what we did, and they changed their mind a bit. But. Um, <laughs> But it meant we could have a, a room where people could come in and they could, they could see the work actually being produced. So it's a great advantage from a dark, from dark room days because you can actually see the thing uh, being produced. We were working on computers in there and people could come in and, as well and work on computers. So it's about being a, um, it's under Walter Benjamin called author as producer. It's that idea that you, you don't just author something, you produce it. And it is possible now to do that all in one space. These are, so Peter's got a long ranging history in working with the, the method of photo montage, um, which was not our starting point when we started collaborating because we had stopped using photo montage for about 10 years. Yeah. Um, but we quickly revisited it when. Did we, don't we show an award in here? Or not? Yeah. No. So, what we wanted to do was make some posters, and it seemed like the most sensible um, method was going to be photo montage. And Peter quickly taught me the methodology, which is basically 
joining two images together to find the third meaning or to reveal, yeah. reveal something that can't be revealed mm. by the straight press photos on their own. Mm. So we produce a uh, set of posters on, remember we, can, we get it, um, the end of rolls of newsprint from a big newspaper printer in London. So they usually send them back for recycling but we um, get hold of the rolls, they give us the rolls and we can put it through a, a digital printer. So when, when we were at Norwich, uh, where is it? Um, yeah, yeah, we sometimes left the printer on all night printing these things and then People like anti-war campaigners all around that area got to hear about this was going on and they came and took the posters. So it was like creating a resource in that sense for people to come in and take them. And they're trying to make very um, graphic, simple images. Um, like David was talking about trying to make a placard that um, can't ever appear in the <coughs> on the street, so I guess with these posters it was trying to make something that would be graphically strong enough that you couldn't miss it um, in amongst all the advertising noise, which works with some of them and not others. What Robin was just trying to say there was that it's like some of my t-shirts, so at some point there were people who were making t-shirts with some of these images, the business as usual and the petrol pump bullet. Um, which is another way that they can quite easily be transferred to the, into, into the streets. Um, and it's just taking it up, handing it out basically to <laughs> activists at the G8 in Glen Eagles in 2005. And at Trafalgar Square, just trying to stick up the posters ourselves, although I think you know, we only lasted having posters there for half an hour before the heritage sort of protectors of Trafalgar Square mm -hmm. came to take them there. How did we go forward? Should, yeah. So, but, yeah. so that's, the one that, that's the one that's had most uh, mileage. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting, it's got a lot of um, uh, people see, sort of respond to it, I think they identify with it in a different one. In fact, someone today, a woman who was selling socialist work out there, said that in fact that phone, I mean, you keep getting new facts about it, it's a very simple picture, but in fact that phone doesn't operate as a, as a camera. <laughs> <laughs> I think I never knew. You yeah, so it, it, it was a PR shot, you had cadets behind it that was set up, so they obviously just handed in the phone, wasn't they? So that's a new fact that we can know about and come. Yeah, <laughs> what, 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 I th what we think makes this particular photo montage work so brilliantly is that it was, it was a press, the portrait of Blair, that element of it, was a press call photograph, was set up by his own PR to launch his election campaign in 2005. Um, and I think that's, it's the subversion of that, what he wanted to be his official image, you know, um, that, that really makes it. Because um, I've looked, we have looked, for the US, we have looked for images of Gordon Brown and images of Cameron and images of Osborne to do some sort of similar subversion and we just can't find um, the right sort of portrait, that, that, or nothing that rings as true as, as that. And that's where, when it was in um, Santos Ghetto, which I think Banksy does in Oxford Street, that's when it got taken up a lot by the media. And, and tons of people, especially young people, come and replicate the image in a sense, you know, like it's got mimetic sort of quality to it. Um, and then it got into quite a few newspapers. And, but also got used, this is by the British Medical Journal, so they've used it as being about the assault on the NHS, which is nice if it can be used in that way. And, uh, and then, and, uh, yeah, advertising for, for um, a, what are they called? Cop direct Campaign. It's um, the ad advertiser's trade magazine. Yeah, and they, were, they asked four professional sort of industry people what was their famous favourite advert of the year. So the uh, three of them chose adverts and one of them chose photo op. So again it gets into a different context. And that's for I mean it's been used for Stop the War. The last time we did it, we did it when he we came for the second time for the Chilcot inquiry Blair and we, we projected it um, with a moving image of the flames behind onto 
Central Hall. This is showing how the media are able to pick up and, and um, run photo montage very easily because it's such a, I mean, it's made up of press images, so it's, it's right for media and, uh, use. And the last time it got used, um, it was by the Legion, British, the magazine yeah. of the British Legion, yeah. who, did, who used it very big, which is great. But it was the same time that he'd announced, Blair had announced that he was going to give the profits from his book to the British Legion. So hopefully he got the, the, his first copy of the magazine sent to him and opened it and got it. <laughs> so we, we, while we were doing that, when we do the, the montage work, we've also tried to make much bigger work that is much more physical. So this, is, this work is um, printed and then stuck onto newspaper. It's about five metres long by three high, something like that. It's very big. To try and get a sort of physical, it's not really a physical feeling of what, that's impossible, but a physical breaking up to try and represent the destruction in a destructive sort of medium. In a, and also a delicate medium, because this is all newspapers that are falling down and breaking up. And it's like it's all papier mache. And that's. I think it's also, um, to make the photo montage, we were pouring through literally thousands of images that were coming out of Iraq, press images. And sort of, um, what's the right word for the press, press photographers that go out regularly to war zones and shoot off reams of images? I mean, what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to get at is that there's so little context often for deeply disturbing pictures um, and I think what we were trying to do when we started to make bigger work with still using press imagery but trying to make something that was very different from how you would see it in a newspaper was to try and get some sort of deeper context or some sort of deeper sense when you saw the image and that would have some sort of more direct impact on your physical space that you were in um, because we were getting quite disturbed by by the sort of uh, seamlessness of the the pictures and how they don't seem to, in their straight form, carry a humanity to them, even though they're showing sort of deeply disturbing hum destruction of humans and including dead people or wounded people. Somehow, there's something wrong with um, the sort of flat surface of the photograph. So we were ripping and shredding through the surface of the images. And sort of bashing them, yeah. That, that was one, well that sort of speaks for itself, that's a montage. But we went to uh, Bethlehem, Palestine, and put it on the gate. Like, there was a, a Palestinian printer who usually does point of sale stuff for coats and things, and he was, we just uh, got a contact for him. He was really happy to make something. This was printed on a commercial printer on sticky back. Material so we can stick it straight onto this, onto the gate, the gate that goes into, opens and closes into Israel. Um, and, uh, um, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, it's interesting as well because this, this that, that image uh, of the, the soldier this, uh, was something that we made again in 2005, and it was about, um, we were making at that point about Iraq, but it complete it translates yeah. exactly the same for. Palestine and and and, and um, yeah, and it's quite extraordinary. Also, Peter's just finished a new book in which there's what images that you made 40 years ago, mm. um, yes. and they translate completely into the present day now. And that was another one we did for the, the Nakba, um for Palestinian. 60th anniversary. 60th anniversary. So that again is a hoarding. I mean, it's great one can actually get the stuff onto hoardings, obviously, but it's not easy. There needs to be quite a bit of backing. Okay, one more minute. And that was another one on the hoarding. Um, just quickly, these are some of the images that come from this sort of work that we've done for the magazines. This one was done for Greenpeace. That was when he was doing his third runway. Yeah, one minute. Yeah, okay, and that was a Christmas card uh, based on the experience of being in Palestine. Um, so you can see that the work goes into a lot of different contexts. Um, can I see that last one again? Hmm? See the, the call on the cobweb again? 
Uh, what, you want to go back for it? Yeah, it's that one. Yeah. That was the sort of uh, public event we did with the cafe um, um, in the city. Um, well, I won't explain all that. We've got one. 30 seconds. But we gave out soup for free to an area where bankers are. And then, and then but we're ostensibly charging them a proportion. Um, uh, what was it? What was the percentage? We're, we're charging I can never explain it. lend hands 20 for a bowl of soup. Um, of course, the milk London bought it, but the idea we were pricing it according to the percentage of daily wage that the lowest paid worker in the world had to pay. The percentage they had to pay for a meal of their daily wage. We took the same percentage and applied it to an investment banker's daily wage. And that was that's very well explained. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so we, so it was good soup. But, um, <laughs> they didn't often take it from me, they thought I was going to poison them for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got the equation. Yeah. Isn't that Bob Diamond, the guy who ran Barclays or something? It looks just like him. <laughs> who ran what? <laughs> Barclays. Didn't admit that to us. Barclays? Yeah, yeah. Yes. No. Is it? It looks like that to me, but anyway, sorry. Just wow. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be right. <that. laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Bob Diamond? Bob Diamond. I can look him up. Look him up. Yeah, we do a face check. And then for some reason it got chosen by the, the design we did as one of the 100 top world designs of uh, last year, which was great to go into that place where they have a lot of very swish designs. And, and our one did show where the source of all this wealth comes from. It showed the people actually making the world. Alongside BMW's latest prototype and the iPhone. Or the iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll leave that one and just quickly just to end on some of the things we did for the stuff, um, for the coalition, um, it was just a series. That was the headline in the Times when this off the first student, big student demo. So we just changed it. We did that poster for the students. I don't know if you recognise them here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then it, the students used it on a march. And then just finally, um, th these were shields that were made. Um, for the for the last march, anti cuts big anti cuts march. So it's like a, a copper against the copper sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, a lot of people. Okay, that's it.